New Orleans Saints interim head coach Darren Rizzi is off to a strong start in his audition for the full-time head coaching job, especially with a historic beginning to his tenure. We got all that and a little bit of land yap for you on today's episode of Lot on Six. You are Locked On Saints, your daily New Orleans Saints podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is good with Houdat Nation and Houdat family? I am your host, your friend, Ross Jackson, New Orleans native, your New Orleans Saints expert and credentialed member of the media covering those New Orleans Saints as a Saints beat writer over at LouisianaSports.net and Saints analyst with WWL TV. And on today's episode, of Locked On Saints. We're taking a little bit of a look back to the New Orleans Saints victory over the Cleveland Browns. We'll discuss Taliesse Fuwana to start it all off. The offensive tackle rookie looking fantastic up against Miles Garrett and the Cleveland Browns. We'll go over a couple of other highlights as well. But I want to focus most of this episode today on Darren Rizzi. I want to discuss why he could make sense as the New Orleans Saints head coach and why he's already off to a strong start, setting a historic beginning. Uh, just here over the course of these first two games. Let's dive into all that here on today's episode. We appreciate you very much for making us your first listener, for being an every day or here on the show, which is a proud part of Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode brought to you by our friends over at FanDuel, where new customers can place a $5 bet and then walk away with $150 in a bonus bets if that bet wins. All you got to do is head over to FanDuel.com to get started today. The New Orleans in search for their future head coach, but he may already be in the building. Darren Rizzi did something historic on Sunday uh, with his win over the Cleveland Browns that has only been done once before in franchise history. Interim head coach Darren Rizzi became the first New Orleans Saints head coach to start 2-0 and since... Sean Payton did it back in 2006. Sean Payton, of course, started 3-0 and back in 2006. Those two coaches are the only two in New Orleans Saints franchise history to start their tenure 2-0. and Only once to start 2-0. and Now, that's not to say that Darren Rizzi starting the same way as Sean Payton means that he'll have the same trajectory as Sean Payton, that he'll finish the same way as Sean Payton, anything like that. But man, look, when you get an opportunity like what Darren Rizzi has right now, which is effectively an eight-game audition, early audition for a job that the Saints are going to interview a lot of people for, you got to make good on it. And so far, so good for Darren Rizzi. Um, Darren Rizzi has made good on the early audition opportunity here, not just because of a 2-0 and start, although that has to be the most important part of it, right? As you've heard many times, this is a results-based business, and winning is a result that brings greater results. So that should not be, you know, we, we shouldn't bat an eye at that at all, right? However, there's more to the story as well. I want you to think about the first touchdown that the New Orleans Saints scored with Darren Rizzi at the helm that was against the Atlanta Falcons. All those players, they celebrate with one another, but then they go straight to the sideline, and what do they do? They celebrate with their head coach, Darren Rizzi. Later on in that game, young Wei Koo, the Atlanta Falcons field goal kicker, lines up to kick a field goal. It gets blocked by John Ridgway the third, somebody that the Saints acquired via trade before the season. Didn't see a ton of action, is seeing a lot more action right now. What did they do? They ran straight to the sideline, and they celebrated with Darren Rizzi. The Saints win the game against a bitter rival Atlanta Falcons. What do they do? They celebrate with Darren Rizzi. They celebrate with Darren Rizzi so hard that he lost feeling in his left arm and almost toppled over because of it. But, uh, They celebrated with their head coach. Let's go to Cleveland. Or let's go to the game against Cleveland here in the great city of New Orleans. The New Orleans Saints get a um, third down stop. Carl Granderson did a great job on the weird reverse thing that the the Cleveland Browns were trying to do. And what does he do? He goes over the sideline. He walks up to Darren Rizzi. They go chest to chest. They throw their arms out and they go, Grando, which is something that Darren Rizzi has been doing with Carl Granderson for, I believe it's years now at this point. 
This is a team that has embodied the personality of its head coach, that is reflecting its head coach, and that is celebrating its head coach. No offense to Dennis Allen, but we didn't see the New Orleans Saints doing things like that as a roster running to the sideline to celebrate with their coach. We didn't see the intensity of what you're seeing from Darren Rizzi on the sideline, shouting, getting into players. Uh, The big eyes, right? Big eyes, so big as he's watching everything happen, very expressive face. They're posted his face as a meme all over NFL Fox Sunday, Fox NFL Sunday or whatever. It's just different. And all of those little things matter, every single one of them. The connection to the player, the connection to the fan base. How about that, right? Getting the first victory of his tenure up against the rival Atlanta Falcons and then reveling in it after the game, talking about how he wants to get dome field advantage back for the city of New Orleans. He wants to get the dome back to where it used to be. Then he comes in after the Cleveland Browns game and gives credit to the fans for having an impact all throughout the second half, really all throughout the game, but highlighted the big impact that the fans had in the stands over the course of that second half. All of a sudden, by the way, when we saw attendance trickling down, you could sit in the press box, you can see kind of three quarters of the dome as you're sitting in there. Just not not as much. You don't get to see I highlight that because you don't get to see as much as you see when you're actually sitting in the stands where you can see 100% of what's going on. But just the three quarters that you get to see from the press box, uh, I could tell you that there were every week fewer and fewer and fewer and fewer people in that Superdome. And now all of a sudden, attendance is ticking up. Certainly that helps when your team is winning. But when the team is winning because of the things that your head coach and your coaching staff who are led by that head coach are doing, when the team is winning because of the things that the players are doing as led by their head coach who walks into team meetings dressed up in as a construction worker with a level and a hammer and other tools to say we need to level this out, hammer it home to finish the job, and they're responding to that, fans are going to show up, tickets are going to sell. So you look at the game result, you look at the connection to the, to the player, you look at the connection to the coaching staff, who Clint Kubiak called probably his best game of the season up against Cleveland. Everything was in there. More motion, play action, but all the different ways they utilized motion, all the different ways they used Taysom and, 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 and Alvin and the way that they used Derek Carr. Sitting Derek Carr in motion, crazy. Love it. You know what I mean? Uh, Joe Woods called a great game over on defense as well. He's put so much back into the players' hands on the defensive side that the players are loving it. Then you look at the connection with the fan base. And on top of all of that, look at the preparation that is going in and the focus on the preparation. Derrick Rizzi said that they had three goals coming into this game. Focus on the preparation. uh, Win the line of scrimmage. They ran 214 yards. They allowed only 66 rushing yards. That's, That's winning the line of scrimmage. And then finish. And they scored 21 points in the fourth quarter. And the focus on preparation has been there. The activation period, he's thinking about uh, teams, uh, the team's roster and its families. He's going to move up after this bye week. He's going to move up practice on Tuesday and Wednesday. So that Tuesday is Wednesday. Wednesday is Thursday. Then the players are going to get Thursday off so that they can have Thanksgiving with their families and they come back to work on Friday to finish up the practice week. It's all there. Everything from the little things to the big things like the win, the little things like the motivation, the connections, giving Thanksgiving off to players, which if you think that's a small thing, it moves the needle, man. Like that's something that matters to people. That's something that matters to humans. You know what I'm saying? And then you walk away on top of that and then you're also coming back with the big results. The Saints might not win the game against the Los Angeles Rams this weekend, but I guarantee you that if they are next weekend, if they don't win that game, no one's going to be moping. No one's going to be upset. No one's going to be, they'll be frustrated that they lost. They'll be upset that they lost. But Darren Rizzi's not going to let anybody kind of live in that moment uh, for longer than they need to. So for all those reasons, I'll say Darren Rizzi has made really good on his first two weeks of this early eight-week audition. Now he's got the next seven, or next, sorry, next seven weeks, including the bye week, but the next six weeks of games uh, to continue to prove it. 
But next thing I want to dive into is why he could make absolute sense for the New Orleans Saints, not just because of what he's proven, but because of what stands before him. Let's get to that next as we continue on with today's episode of Locked on Saints, part of Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode of Locked on Saints is brought to you by the pre-alcohol drink by Z-Biotics. It's the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by PhD scientists to help tackle those mornings after drinking. So here's how it works. When you drink, uh, your the alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut. It's that byproduct, not dehydration, that's to blame for your rough next day. So the pre-alcohol provides an enzyme to break this byproduct down. So just remember to make Z-Biotics your first drink of the night, drink responsibly, and you'll feel at your best tomorrow. It's that simple. You got a wedding that you're going to, big event, something like that. Take that pre-alcohol by Z-Biotic first. Go enjoy yourself, drink responsibly, and then be ready for those meetings or your podcasts the next day. Whatever it is that you got going on, just go to zbiotics.com slash locked in NFL to learn more and get 15% off of your first order when you use the promo code locked on NFL at checkout. Zbiotics is backed by a 100% money back guarantee. If you're unsatisfied for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Remember to head to zbiotics.com slash locked on NFL and use code locked on NFL at checkout for 15% off. Today's episode also brought to you by our friends over at FanDuel, where you can continue to tackle this NFL season with America's number one sportsbook. And it's great right now for new customers as well, because new customers are going to be able to put down $5 and then get $150 in bonus bets back. If you win that first $5 bet, the FanDuel Sportsbook app is going to give you everything that you need, including live betting during games. You can get into some of the latest stats, live play-by-play, all in the same place where you place your bets. New Orleans Saints are, of course, on a bye week right now. But if you like the trajectory of what you're seeing from Darren Rizzi, they have updated the win total for the season. Instead of the over-under being set at 7.5, it's now down to 6.5. So if you think the New Orleans Saints are going to win more than that, you can get in on that. $100 wins you a little bit over 60. Or you can bet that they're going to come under. $100 wins you 116. So you can get on all of that over at FanDuel.com and get started with $150 in bonus bets. If you win your first $5 bet, that's FanDuel.com. Never waste a hunch and make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NFL. All right, family. Yes, interim head coach Darren Rizzi for the New Orleans Saints has started the first two games of his early audition well. But I want to take a look at what's ahead of him and why it could all amount to him actually being the right choice for the New Orleans Saints as a potential future head coach, not just the convenient one. I think over the years, you look at the Sean Payton coaching tree, right? Sean Payton coaching tree has been one that hasn't been massively successful away from Sean Payton. Most of the guys that have worked with Sean Payton are currently still working with Sean Payton as they went over to the Denver Broncos. Of course, the glaring exception, aside from Doug Marone, uh, ends up being a look at the Detroit Lions, right? Uh, Dan Campbell, that's a Sean Payton guy, went over to Detroit, has led what is right now, I think, the most dominant NFL team um, as a part of that. Aaron Glenn over on the defensive side of that football as a defense coordinator, doing fantastic. That's technically a Sean Payton guy. Uh, and then you've got other guys that are in there as well that have been a part of the Sean Payton coaching staff. But, you know, you think about guys like Joe Lombardi and Pete Carmichael, former offensive coordinator and quarterback coach for the New Orleans Saints, those guys are now holding effectively support roles in Sean Payton's staff over in Denver um, with Pete Carmichael serving as an offensive advisor or offensive assistant while Joe Lombardi is the offensive coordinator, but he ain't calling no plays, right? So I think you look at all those other guys that are over there, you know, Zach Streif going over there, all that, like they're all holding sort of good positions, but still working kind of under the Sean Payton wing. They haven't branched out and been able to find success outside of Sean Payton just yet. And, and to be fair, Zach Shreve hasn't gotten that opportunity yet, but he will uh, over the course of time. So, you know, you look at kind of those little pieces and things like that, like that shows you kind of where the Sean Payton coaching tree is. But I think Darren Rizzi is an important one to look at as more than just a Sean Payton guy. Darren Rizzi's, Darren Rizzi's a Parcells guy, just like Sean Payton was, right? It was before 
um, Sean Payton that Darren Rizzi was already finding success in the NFL as one of the most respected um, and 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 in, in high demand special teams coordinators uh, in the league and across the league. And so you have to separate um, you have to separate Darren Rizzi and Sean Payton a little bit, but then also accept the Sean Payton influence on Darren Rizzi. And I think you see the Sean Payton influence on Darren Rizzi big time. I mean, I made reference to a story that um, I think it was Ugo, Ugo Amadi told first, Juwan Johnson elaborated on, and then Darren Rizzi spoke about, and I think it was Matthew Paris over at NOLA.com that, that, that continued that thread, which was awesome and great work by Matt. Um, around like, you know, him showing up dressed up as a construction worker and kind of using it to teach us like that brings you back to Sean and the, you know, cheese being left at the lockers, don't eat the cheese or wheeling in, you know, the, the, the playoff bonus check amount in dollar bills, uh, into the facility and all this other stuff, everything like that brings you back to that. And that, that's, that's very, I'll call it Parcelsian. Um, as well and just being sort of no nonsense while also having a connection to your players so that when you are no nonsense they respect your no nonsensedness that goes a long way as well and that is of course a part of that Parcelsian way of coaching as well so I wanted to kind of draw the line of the the coaching tree a little bit because I think if you're looking to pluck from a coaching tree of leadership the Parcells tree is a really, really freaking good one to pull from. There's absolutely no doubt about that. So I want to give that the highlight. But then you look at what the Saints have lying ahead of them for the rest of the season. They've got the Los Angeles Rams at home. They'll travel to take on uh, the New York Giants. Those are a pair of winnable games. I think the Rams are going to be a tougher test than people give them credit for, just because of the offense and how the Saints defense has struggled. Guys like Alante Taylor, Kool-Aid McKinstry, they're going to be put to test uh, going up against Cooper Cup and Puka Nakua and all the other stuff and, and, and Matthew Stafford for that, for that matter. But the Saints have also beat the Rams in the recent past and being able to go up against those guys and go toe-to-toe. The biggest thing is can you start fast and finish? I think are going to be the biggest pieces of that game in particular. So I, I, I think that that's a good test for you to be able to say, okay, you were able to knock off the division opponent. You're able to beat the team that you're better than, but that has sort of that flashy ability to be able to overcome your team in the Cleveland Browns and James Winston, right? When he's hot, he's hot. There's no doubt about that. But then now you kind of get to go up against the slow and steady success of a Sean McVay and Matthew Stafford and Puka Nakua and Cooper Cup and, you know, uh, uh, Kyron Williams and a good offensive line and all those other things. The, the Rams defense is a little shaky, so you should have the opportunity to be able to keep pace because the Saints have shown that they can be explosive. Curious to see if they keep the Taysom Hill game plan or if they feel like, okay, really leaned into the Taysom Hill game plan last time, maybe switch over to Alvin Kamara a little bit more. But in either case, right, finding success on the ground is going to be important in that game. So those are three very different tests. Then you get to go on the road to take on a team that you're better than. So that's a whole new test, right? Everything that you do at home is one thing. Everything you do on the road is another thing. And so if the Saints can find a way to become a dominant home team again, then all of a sudden, uh uh-oh, there's something there. Then you go on the road, you have the uh, the Giants, you come back to take on the Commanders, that's going to be big because you've got the rookie quarterback conundrum, you've got the mobile quarterback conundrum, Jaden Daniels, offensive rookie of the year, has been playing incredible so far this season. Can you put a cap on that somehow, some way? Um, then you've got, you know, your, your final three games where you're on the road, which is tough up against Green Bay, which has played very well this season, winter game outside in the cold away, all that home against the Raiders again, an opportunity to beat a better team than you are, sorry, a team that you are better than. And then on the road up against Tampa, a team that you should be better than by that. Uh, especially if they're still without their key players, Chris Godwin, uh, 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 Mike Evans and all that. You've already proven too that you can go at the end of a season to Tampa and win those games. So can you keep that going? So you have sort of this variety of different styles of games uh, that are in front of you. And if you can prove yourself to be competitive in those games, not not necessarily win those games. I mean, win them where you can, don't get me wrong. But if you can prove that you are competitive in those games, then that really, really sets you up looking at Darren Rizzi at, you know, 
four and four and four by the time it's all done with, five and three by the time it's all done with. And and I get this question a lot, is he a legitimate candidate? And the answer is yes. He was a legitimate candidate back in 2022 as well, even though we all knew they were going to hire Dennis Allen because Dennis Allen got his audition in that one Tampa game that they won in Tampa nine to zero when Sean Payton was out with COVID and all of this stuff. And it was like, okay, well, he already had his audition. They won that game. It was a defensive masterpiece, all these other things. Like, yeah, he's going to be the guy. And so now, Darren Rizzi got eight in them things to be able to say, okay, I'm the right guy. And so he could prove to be the guy by the time that it's all said and done. I think the Saints would still do right in going out there and having those interviews and everything like that. Because if you roll with Rizzi, you go with the interim coach thing, there's always the risk that it doesn't pan out. I mean, look, any head coaching uh, selection, there's always a risk that it doesn't pan out. So go out there, interview, start to build your book so that if you're back in the market in the next couple of years, first of all, you built a good relationship with some of these guys through interviews and everything like that. And then you have kind of already identified the talent that you want to work with and everything. But I think that the Saints could roll with Darren Rizzi if the rest of this season works out and he finishes strong with this team. Um, especially a team without its wide receivers, a team without its its starting starting cornerbacks, a team you know that's still dealing with injuries on the offensive line, all that. By the way, Eric McCoy's injury is said to not be too big of a deal. They just wanted to play it cautious with him. Sounds like everything should be okay there, but we'll get more information as the weeks roll along here before the Rams game. Uh, but if you're looking for a guy that's going to be able to lead your team, Darren Rizzi has proven so far that he can be that guy. And that's what he needs to continue to prove. If he wants to be the right hire, the guy that could make sense, uh, then I think doing so by leading the team, allow your coordinators to coordinate and showing the value of what a special teams coach can do as a head coach, I think moves the needle massively uh, in his favor if they're able to finish out strong. All throughout the rest of the week, going into next week, by the way, we're going to be visited by some other locked on hosts from around the NFL uh, who are going to be telling us a little bit about why somebody that they cover could be the Saints head coach. My goal is to bring you five episodes, 15 coaches, so that you have everything that you need far before the coaching hunt starts. And so we're going to dive into all of that here throughout the rest of the week. I hope that you tune in for that. And then I'll also do bonus episodes as well to kind of keep you up to date with anything that's happening throughout the bye week. But this feels like the right time to do it. But this is where I wanted to start. I wanted to start with Darren Rizzi because Darren Rizzi deserves the respect of at least being interviewed and certainly right now deserves the respect of being the favorite uh, to be the New Orleans Saints head coach. We'll see how that shifts, changes, or stays the same over the course of the next six games, seven weeks with a bye week this week. Coming up, let's take one more look back at this Cleveland Browns game before we depart from it entirely because Taliese Fulanga, the New Orleans Saints' first round uh, tackle, was absolutely outstanding. We got that coming up for you next as we continue on with today's episode of Locked on Saints, part of Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode of Locked on Saints brought to you by Built Rewards. So you tired of just kind of being in that endless cycle of rent payments, watching your money vanish into thin air? Well, now it's time to turn your rent game around and start earning some serious rewards. Built is breaking ground as the neighborhood rewards program that hooks you up with points for your rent. Every month you pay your rent, and if you watch the bill points roll in, then you can use those points to jet off on a dream vacation, put those points towards your flight or a hotel stay at over 500 airlines, 700,000 plus hotels and properties as well. You can even use your points to book fitness studio classes and redeem them towards future rent payment. They're designed to meet your lifestyle. So pay rent hassle-free to the Built Rewards app. Your rent game just got a major upgrade. Built Points has been consistently ranked amongst the highest and with the highest uh, value point currency by the Points Guy and Bank Rate. Earn points by paying your rent when you go to joinbuilt.com slash locked on NFL. That's J-O-I-N-B-I-L-T dot com slash locked on NFL. Be sure to use our URL so they know that we sent you joinbuilt.com slash locked on NFL to earn points today on your rent payments. Let's get it. Who that nation? The New Orleans Saints might have legitimately drafted an all pro level player in offensive tackle, Tally S. A. Flonga in the first round of this year's draft. And look, I'm not even trying to be, you know, overly hype about this or anything like that. You know me, I'm not a merchant of hype, I'm a merchant of truth. But watching the tape, you can see Tally S. A. Fuonga perform incredibly well throughout this game, particularly in pass protection 
in the run game. There were some little slips here and there and things like that, but still very good. Uh, but in pass protection, he was absolutely outstanding in this game. Um, Miles Garrett, who lined up in front of Taliesi Fulana multiple times in this game. In fact, the majority of the Saints dropbacks, that's where he was, 20, 23 total dropbacks. He was lined up over the left half. Now, there were times where he stunted towards the inside, things like that. Uh, but Miles Garrett got only two pressures in this game and achieved only an 8% pressure percentage in this game. Those numbers are important because they're the lowest of Miles Garrett's season so far. The big terror of Miles Garrett going into this game, uh, or was rather Miles Garrett going into this game, and many people forgot he was on the field. And that just goes to show you how well the New Orleans Saints offensive line as a whole played in this game, but also how well Taliesi Fong in particular played in this game. Uh, there were 23 different pass pass plays, right? So dropbacks only that uh, Miles Garrett lined up over the left tackle. Sorry, 23 total plays, 16 total passing plays, my apologies, uh, in which Miles Garrett lined up over the left tackle. Out of those, about 13, 12 or 13 uh, of those plays included Miles Garrett going up against Salayese Fuango one-on-one. And he won just about every single one of those snaps. There's one that you could say either Taliese made him run the arc too wide for it to really be a pressure, but you could also consider that Derek Carr maybe felt the heat a little bit. Derek Carr also just got the ball out quickly, so that could be a big part of it too. But I don't. I would say at best one loss for Taliese Puanga throughout those 13 snaps one on one. I'll be at 12 or 13 snaps going one on one against uh, Miles Garrett. There were a couple of examples. The reason why I say 12 or 13 is depending upon how you count double teams because there was a couple of times where Nick Saldaveri at left guard was free to go over to help Taliese, but didn't get there in time, first of all. And then secondly, Flano was fine before he even showed up. And so I think that that was the other part of it. And when I say didn't get there in time for Nick Saldaveri, I mean before the ball came out. Like there was a lot of quick passing in this game. Um, One of Garrett's two pressures came from him bending inside and actually getting a pressure directly up the middle. So it had nothing to do with Fuanga. He was lined up over Fuanga, but he ended up running that stunt towards the inside, got pressure right up the middle. Derek Carr was able to complete it for like a nine-yard pass to Foster Moreau late in the game. So pretty solid stuff there. Uh, So when it comes to what the Saints have got in Taliesi Fuanga, they clearly have one of the best um, left tackles in the game right now. They clearly have one of the best um, uh, rookies in the game right now. And a guy that's probably not going to get, uh, that's probably not going to get, you know, all pro recognition his rookie year or anything like that, but is definitely going to be a player that can grow into being an all pro level player if this is where he starts. He'll probably have a little bit of a downturn his sophomore year, the sophomore slump, but then he'll prove who he really is in year three. So expect it to be still a little bit of a roller coaster for the rookie. But man, in terms of just where the Saints have been in the first round when it comes to drafting these offensive linemen and stuff like that, and sort of the the question marks that have been there, I think, and I know I'm of the minority here, but I think Caesar Reese has turned into a very solid. Uh, right guard in the league but I know a lot of people disagree with that Uh, but even still he had even if even if that is the case now even if you do agree with that agree with me on that it it didn't start off that way right it was rocky as it started Trevor Penning who's been outstanding at right tackle so far this season rocky as his career started dealing with injuries struggling at left tackle all of this stuff tell us if Wonga has skipped the struggle phase right he skipped the initial struggle phase he has come into immediately being the team's long-term left tackle option at the position. Barring anything changing anytime soon, he was outstanding in this game, and the Saints actually got a real big dub in this one, like big-time dub in this one. Um, I want to go over each of the pressures that Miles Garrett is credited with, one of which he was actually lined up and was able to get the wide nine formation, so he was outside the tight end, so it was really him and Taysom Hill one-on-one. Taysom actually stopped him on the outside pursuit. He bent back inside, got pressure on the inside. 
You heard me talk about the one a moment ago. Oh, by the way, that play ended up being a 14-yard completion to Taysom Hill uh, on that very play. You heard me talk about the ones where he technically starts lined up over Taliese. He gets chipped by uh, by Taysom Hill and then runs an inside arc to be able to get up the middle. So again, not on Taliese at all in that situation. And in the other pressure that he was credited with, depending on if you consider this one a pressure, I don't. And, and next-gen stats didn't either. Uh, but there is one you could potentially consider a pressure, which is the one where I talked about him getting to the outside. That's actually him lined up on um, on Foster Moreau. That's actually not him up against Taliesi Fuang at all. So you saw the New Orleans Saints offensive pass protection just be stellar all throughout this one, led by um, its young rookie. All right, a couple of other little notes that I kind of want to go over as well. I want to make sure that you know that Alvin Kamara is one receiving touchdown away from being the uh, fourth player in NFL history with 50 rushing touchdowns and 25 passing touchdowns uh, or receiving touchdowns, or 50 or more, or 25 or more uh, in their career. He's got 60 rushing touchdowns right now, 24 receiving touchdowns going into this game. He was outstanding. Uh, Derek Carr was, again, perfect against the Blitz, just like he nearly was against Atlanta. Now, the Browns didn't Blitz as much as they typically do, but Derek Carr was 5 of 5 for 117 yards in a pair of touchdowns against the Blitz. Bring the pressure and uh, taste, excuse me, taste him. Uh, Derek Carr has been outstanding going up against it. And then speaking of taste him, taste him, uh, according to next gen stats, accumulated 138 rushing yards and three touchdowns on seven carries coming out of Wildcat. And in that Wildcat alignment, he's now con- con- contributed, excuse me, the most rushing yards and rushing touchdowns out of Wildcat in a single game. Since next gen stats existed <laughs> back in 2016. So pretty cool stuff there. We keep comparing Taysom Hill to, you know, this guy in the 1920s, this guy in the 1970s, this guy in the 1930s, this guy in the in the 1500s, all this stuff that we have to continue to do because he's so unique a player. And I'm I'm serious when I say I don't think we'll ever see another Taysom Hill in the NFL. We'll see players that have impact on multiple positions. Travis Hunter could be one of the most exciting players we've seen maybe since Taysom Hill because of his ability to probably play cornerback at the NFL level, but then have packages at wide receiver over on the other side. So that could be really fun. But no one is going to be able to go through a 200-page or 200-play playbook and look at the seven different ways that they're used in every single one of those plays and then go out there and execute it on Sundays. Incredible stuff from Taysom Hill yet again. All right, y'all, we appreciate you very much for being here and for joining us for another episode. Tomorrow, uh, we'll get started with our series of looking at uh, different head coaching candidates for the New Orleans Saints. Take advantage of the bye week here and get you up to date. We're going to do that over the course of the next five episodes because I want to give you 15 coaches, but I'll also cut extra episodes and stuff like that when there's news. Make sure you have all the latest as well. Insiders will have a film study coming on the opening drive and Taliesi Fuonga throughout this week. Got some extra time with the bye week, so I want to do multiple things. So if you want to join the Insider Program and get more, including film studies, Q&As, all that other stuff, you can text that to 504-285-7473. Follow the prompts. four ninety nine a month. First 14 days are free, though, so you can find out if you actually like it before you contribute to the show. Uh, and then you can also join with the link in the description. We will see you tomorrow for another episode of Locked on Saints. Until then, make sure for you second listen today, you go and check out Locked on NFL, but thank you for making Locked on Saints your first listen. We appreciate you very much for making us a part of your day, part of your routine, for saying yes to me on the show. As always, if you see me, please say hi. If you had anything else around your New Orleans Saints in between these episodes, make sure you follow me on your favorite social media. At Ross Jackson, N-O-L-A. Hit me up. Learn how the family's doing how you're living. Let me know how you're momming them. And trust you, that nation, I'll holla at you. 